Today we're talking about pre-meal prayer. Very confusing subject. A lot of people don't know when to pray, what to pray for, how to pray, who prays. Or, hey, do you want me to, should I pray? You wanna, should we pray? I don't know if, all very confusing. We're gonna cover it all today. Let's get started. Chips and salsa. Sometimes they bring it to the table before you're even seated. There's no need to pray for that. Lots of people wonder about appetizers. Do you pray for them? Do you not pray for them? No prayer is necessary for an appetizer if you have entrees coming out later. Salad, that is the most confusing thing on the prayer continuum. If it's a side salad or an appetizer salad, no need for prayer there. Now, if it's a main course salad or you're bringing it out with the rest of everyone else's meal, that then is gonna require some kind of prayer. But I put that kind of in a separate category. For the most part, when you're thinking about salads, just remember this, if it requires dressing, it doesn't require a blessing. Soup, do you pray for soup? Do not pray for soup. It's only bowl related soups. Anything smaller than that is always off the hook. I like to say if it comes in a cup, no need to lift up. Everyone knows if you order a hamburger, that's gonna require prayer. But if you order sliders, that does not require prayer. It's a little glitch in the system a lot of people are not aware of. Potato skins, no prayer. Baked potato, prayer. Last but certainly not least, who at the table volunteers to lead the prayer? Lots of people say the man should lead the prayer. Why is that? I'm not sure, it's 2018. Maybe we should get that rule adjusted at some point in the near future. A lot of people operate under the most spiritual person at the table. They're gonna be the one that should pray because that prayer is gonna be the most powerful and effective. So if you got obviously a pastor, a missionary, even a Christian blogger of some sort, shoot, even a volunteer youth pastor, that prayer is gonna be a little less effective, but it's still gonna qualify. If you're just an average person sitting at the table with obviously more spiritual people around you, you're kind of off the hook, because I feel like God would be like, hey, how come y'all didn't bless this meal? You'd be like, I don't know, ask the pastor, he works for you. Well, that guy's name is John Christ, uh, C-R-I-S-D, if you want to look up his other videos. He's got a ton of them out. They're all sort of church-related humor. He makes me laugh. But the last point about who prays at the meal is really kind of true. Uh, you remember last week, if you were here, Pastor Sterling said that whenever he's back home in Ohio at large family gatherings, picnics, and so forth, they always assume he's going to pray because he's the professional. Well, I told him this week that when it happens to me over the years, I've developed a little fun thing I do, uh, someone will say, hey, Pastor Brian, I'll go, oh, it's 5.30, I'm off duty. <laughs> and just for a second, there's a look of panic, and then I say, well, I I'm kidding, and then I pray for the meal. Well, surveys consistently show that the vast majority of Americans pray and pray regularly. For example, a middle school or high school student prays a silent and desperate prayer before taking a test for which he or she is not really adequately prepared. How many high school medical students are here today? Okay, I see. I know you're probably all really good students and you prepare and you study, but I remember being there and doing that. That's not the best academic strategy, actually. Or a parent prays for the safety and spiritual well-being for a college student 500 miles from home. How many parents of college students are here today? Okay, you know what I'm talking about. You pray like that. Um, a Roman Catholic Christian uh, prays, uh, recites prayers that he or she prays with the rosary. Many of you grew up in that tradition. A worried mother prays for a toddler after a fever has spiked to 103 degrees. If you're a parent, I'm sure you know what that kind of prayer is about. A man in debt prays for a winning lottery ticket. Did you see the story in New York State last week? Just last week, a guy won the single largest lottery jackpot in New York State history, $343 million. I wondered if he prayed before he chose those numbers. Just wondered. We all pray, but we have questions. What is prayer really? How does the technology work? Uh, what's the right way to pray, the right words to pray? Is there a wrong way to pray? We're in the second week of a three-part mini-series called Praying with Jesus. And last week we began by looking at prayer as a lifestyle. And Pastor Sterling here at Mill Creek defined prayer as a conversational relationship with God. And then he went on to describe prayer as sharing what matters most with the one who matters most. And I heard him, uh, that message online uh, this past week, and I love that line, so I asked him, did you, did you read that somewhere? Did you think of that yourself? And he said, well, he kind of thought of it himself. And I said, well, good, because I'm going to use that line like I invented it this week, because it's so good to share what matters most with the one who matters most. Now, the passage we're going to look at today, 
Uh, it takes place in the midst of Jesus, very busy public ministry. The disciples have been following him for several months by this point. Uh, his popularity is exploding. Huge crowds are gathering to hear him teach because he taught like no one they'd ever hear, heard before. They're pressing in around him, uh, many of them looking for healing, looking for miracles. And throughout that time, the disciples have noticed Jesus' own personal practice of prayer, how he often with, would withdraw from the crowds, withdraw from them, and go to lonely places to pray. Luke tells us in Luke chapter 11, one day Jesus was praying in a certain place, and by the way, as you read the Gospels, it seems that Jesus had some, some favorite places he liked to go to pray. And I wonder if you, if you have a favorite place. I think place is important. Uh, a place of prayer. Jesus seemed to have them. He was at a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray. Just as John taught his disciples, talking about John the Baptist. Now, this is interesting to me because these were men who had grown up their whole lives in the Jewish traditions. They had seen their spiritual leaders pray. They had seen the great temple in Jerusalem. They knew what prayer was, but they say, teach us to pray. They saw something in the way Jesus prayed that they wanted. Teach us to pray like you pray, and so he does. Uh, in Matthew chapter 6, which is the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus says this. Jesus is speaking. He says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received their reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words." Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. So before He teaches them how to pray, that comes next week when we actually will teach from what we know as the Lord's Prayer. Jesus spends some time teaching them how not to pray. This is not unlike how we as parents teach our, younger, our, our children how to drive a car. Uh, we spend more energy early on teaching them what not to do, right, before teaching them how to drive. Like, don't drive too fast. Don't break the speed limit. No, don't text while you drive. Don't check your Instagram while you drive. Don't try to eat a Chipotle burrito while you drive. There's a lot of don't, don't do this when you teach to drive. The first thing Jesus teaches about prayer here is prayer is not a performance. Prayer is not a performance. I recently uh, joined some of our other staff members, Tom and Gretchen and Andrew, and being part of a video conference that focused on... Um, a part of our population called emerging adults. Kind of an odd way to talk about it, but emerging adults are young men and women in our culture who are between the ages of 18 and 29. Emerging adults. Now, if the marks of being an adult are finding your vocation and being completely financially independent from your parents, uh, what this uh, seminar was about is that in our culture today, it takes a lot longer uh, to get there than it used to even a generation ago for lots and lots of different reasons. It's a very difficult journey during those age categories. And many of you, some of you here today are in that category of emerging adults. And in our family and children dominated part of the world in the suburbs here, sometimes we don't see people in the emerging adult category very clearly. And we often don't listen to the things they are struggling with. I have four of them that belong to, my, to me. My four sons are all in that category. And it's a difficult journey. And if you're here today and you're in that category, we're glad you're here because the church actually needs your perspective. The church needs the gifts that you have to bring to us. Well, looking back, um, I was an emerging adult before they called it something. I was an emerging adult for like a whole decade of my life. Uh, part of finding my vocation was a ministry internship I did at an inner city church in Pittsburgh way back in 1982. And I've told stories about this, this one summer in my life. The pastor there was a friend of my dad's, and he graciously allowed me just to hang around his church for a whole summer, just to learn what I could learn. And I still remember the very first staff meeting I was in. I had been around church all my life. My dad was a pastor, but I'd never been in a staff meeting. So I, we walked, went into the pastor's office, and he had this big desk, and behind the desk, a big chair that he was sitting in. And behind his back, we sort of referred to his big chair as his throne, because that's what it seemed like. And we were 
sitting in the little chairs around on the other side of his desk. And when time came to start the meeting, he got up kind of ceremoniously and he knelt down behind his desk at his chair. And we were like, he disappeared behind. And I was like looking at the youth pastor like, should we kneel too? What are we supposed to do? I didn't know. And he said, like, don't worry about it. Like he does this all the time. And so he knelt down. We were all sitting there and he began to pray. And it was one of the most beautiful, flowery, ornate prayers I'd ever heard. Something like, O most gracious and glorious God, thou who art exalted far above all things, who created the entire universe by the word of thy mouth, we beseech thee, you know, that kind of thing. And it was just his way. He was kind of old school, what he learned in seminary and so forth. But a part of it also came across um, to sort of establish who the prayer boss was in the room. It was respectful, but it was also, there was an element of performance to it. It was intended to impress, and it did. Jesus here says in verse 5, And when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they have received the reward in full. Now, the word translated hypocrites there is like a direct translation from the Greek word hypocrites that was used to refer to a Greek actor on a stage, someone who was behind a mask playing a part. So who's Jesus talking about here? Who are the hypocrites that he's talking about? Most likely, he's thinking about uh, two groups of people that he would have called the scribes and Pharisees, the most religious people of that culture and that time. Now, the issue he's raising here is not praying in public. The issue here is not praying out loud. The issue is the motive of one's prayers. He's calling out those who are more concerned about appearing to be righteous, appearing to be religious, then they are concerned about the actual condition of their hearts. That's what Jesus is talking about. In Luke 18, he actually tells a story to make his point. Luke 18 says, To some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else, Jesus told this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee, that is an expert in the religious law, and the other a tax collector, which was, would have been someone seen as a, a great sinner. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. Now, Jesus' stories had kind of an edge of humor to them sometimes. I fast twice a week and I give a tenth of all I get. But the tax collector stood at a distance. He would not even look up to heaven, but beat his breast and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I tell you that this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For all those who exalt themselves will be humbled, and those who humble themselves will be exalted. So, what are the characteristics of a hypocrite? I want to mention three things. First, a hypocrite, in Jesus' mind, was a phony. Someone who pretends. Uh, this week, I was looking around for some illustrations, and I came across a curious story of a man named Gerald Barnes. Actually, his mugshot. Now, he grew up in Chicago and was actually a trained actor, but some, for some reason he moved uh, to California and then used his acting skills to pretend that he was a medical doctor. Uh, eventually got a job in a clinic in California, then started his own clinic and eventually saw 30 to 40 patients a day for a decade, even doing minor surgeries. He said he learned by operating on chickens just to figure out how things worked before he was caught. Never had a medical degree, but he pretended. Jesus is saying it's possible to pursue our spiritual lives like that. It's possible to pray like that, to pretend to be that which we are not. Secondly, a hypocrite is one who seeks approval. One of the reasons we are tempted to pretend to be something we're not is to gain the approval of others. For example... In, in how we dress. When I was a freshman and sophomore or so in high school, I didn't pay any attention to, to how I dressed. I was like a sneaker and jeans and t-shirt guy. But right around my junior year, that sort of changed. I, I, I began to uh, realize other people, particularly uh, members of the opposite sex, were paying attention, and I began to be aware of how they paid attention, of what they thought of me. So the next time my mom took me out to get some Sunday clothes, I decided to change my 
my, my look. I wanted to impress. And so, uh, now remember, this is the early 70s, so you've got to ha kind of have that in your mind. I, I chose for myself, I still remember, so glad there were not digital photographs in those days and iPhones and stuff, but I had a, a pair of vertically striped brown and white bell-bottom slacks. I had a, a kind of an oatmeal-colored, triple-breasted blazer with giant lapels like that. Um, and I had platform shoes and some other stuff. I know you're getting a picture in your mind. Don't do that, okay? It was very embarrassing. But the first time, time I had a chance to wear this new getup was at a um, sports banquet uh, after the basketball season, and I walked in wearing this whole outfit. I think there was even a white tie involved. But the first person I saw was a member of my team, a teammate, one of the cool guys on the team. He walked up, he took one look at me, and he went, dang, coffee, you look like one of the Beatles. And he didn't mean it in a good way. I'm not sure I ever wore that outfit like that again. See, seeking approval is dangerous. And Jesus points to the very religious, and he says they are praying to be seen by others. In other words, they are praying to the wrong audience. That's possible. Thirdly, a hypocrite is one who needs to feel superior to others. The Pharisee in Jesus' little story looks down on the less religious person out of a prideful need to feel spiritually superior. At least I'm not as bad as that guy, right? Jesus says, if that's all you're going for, then that's what you're going to get in prayer. That's all you're going to get. In verse 6, he says, when you pray, go into your room, close the door, pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. What does it mean to pray secretly? Now here, um, the word room is interesting. Of the words that he could have used, he chose a word that had a very specific meaning in that culture at that time. It meant, it was sometimes it's translated this way, inner room or closet. And the way uh, people lived, they would have a, a small place in the, in the middle of their home that did not share an outside wall, kind of like we would think of a pantry or something, but it was a secret room where they would store their, their valuables or their treasures that they couldn't be reached from the outside. So in a sense, Jesus is saying, when you pray, go to the place where you keep your treasures. Go to the place where you keep your secrets, because that's the place where your Father wants to meet you. Remember, prayer is sharing what matters most with the one who matters most. He's teaching us that the opposite of hypocrisy is honesty and humility. And there's evidence in the New Testament that that's the way Jesus prayed. In Hebrews chapter 5, there's a beautiful verse that says, During the days of Jesus' life on earth, he offered up prayers and petitions with fervent cries and tears. The word translated fervent cries there means guttural groans, almost inhuman groans of anguish to the one who could save him from death. Jesus prayed like that. Have you ever prayed like that? Do you know you're invited to pray like that? Do you know you can go to your secret place and be honest with the God who is your Father? The Psalms in our Bible, right in the middle, the Psalms are ancient songs that are really prayers. And they're full of this kind of prayer. Psalm 13, for example, how long, Lord, will you forget me forever? How long will you hide your face from me? Or Psalm 69, save me, O God, for the waters have come up to my neck. I've often encouraged people who feel trapped in a difficult season of life or, or stuck in their prayers. I've encouraged them to just read through the Psalms until you find a Psalm that speaks the words your heart needs to speak, because you'll find it. They're there. Honesty with God is what we call confession, not just of sin, certainly of sin, but more than that, of anger, grief, pain, whatever is in the secret place. Prayer is not a performance, it's a relationship. And all relationships begin with honesty. That's the first thing. Second thing Jesus teaches us here is that prayer is not magic. It's not magic. Let me try to explain. Many of you know I spent years, um, a number of years as a youth pastor. And what I enjoyed most about uh, working with students was uh, watching young men and women discover faith on their own, apart from their parents or, or the family, to begin to build genuine relationship with God. 
And there was nothing quite like that. They would grow and they would just burst into life and they would, they would use words and ask questions that were just so genuine and so refreshing. And one night uh, at a senior high Bible study I was leading, we used to have it on Wednesday nights in a local community center. There'd be about 40 or 50 students there. And one night, um, we, after we had the teaching time and a small group question time, I, would, I, I usually had a few minutes of prayer time at the end and I would ask students if they had anything they wanted me to pray for. And a kid raised his hand from the back a young man who I knew was new because he was his first time there. I, I didn't know him anywhere, but he, I was always surprised. He raised his hand right in the back of the room, and I said, yeah. And he said, um, uh, like, uh, could you pray that I won't get grounded? And I was like, hmm, sounds like there's a story there. So I said, can you share a little bit more? He went on to say that the previous night, yesterday, he had uh, broken curfew with some buddies, hang, hang, uh, hanging out with them. He's out late. In fact, since he broke curfew, he decided, he decided he stayed out all night, never went home. Went to school that day. After school, went to hang out with his buddies again, then came straight to our high school Bible study, had not been home yet. He said, so would you pray I won't get grounded? And I had to make a decision. Uh, and so I said, um, I'm really glad you're here. I'm really glad that you, you shared that, but I'd like to pray a little bit differently, if that's okay. Now, he looked kind of surprised and confused. And I said uh, something like this, God wants you to come to him for help. He does. But he also uh, likes it when we're really honest with him. And here's what I suggest I pray tonight. I'd like to pray that God would give you the courage to go home tonight and admit to your parents what you did, apologize to them for what you did, and say you trust them any punishment that they decide is okay with you. And then I'll pray that God gives them wisdom to do, to do the right thing. How, how does that sound? And he went, uh, okay. <laughs> Jesus says, verse 7, And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them. For your Father knows what you need before you ask him. What does Jesus mean by babbling like pagans? Now, the word you translated here, pagans, is the word ethnikos in Greek, it, the word from which we get the word ethnic. And in that culture, it just meant non-Jewish people, non-Israelites, Romans, Gentiles, Greeks, that sort of thing. When we think of the word pagan, we think of someone who is um, completely godless. But that's not what Jesus would have assumed. He would have assumed these were very religious people, uh, Romans had all kinds of gods. The Greeks had all kinds of gods, all kinds of, of spiritual rituals and things like that. Uh, but they had a faulty view of God, therefore a faulty religion, because they thought of the gods as being capricious and cruel and toying with mortals, and their prayers were sort of magical incantations to try to get the gods to favor them. Jesus says, don't pray like that. The word babbling uh, means to stammer or to blubber nonsense. Sort of like a magician pulling a rabbit out of the hat by saying abracadabra, just nonsense words. So when I say prayer is not magic, uh, I'm talking about three things. First, magical prayer is prayer that assumes the purpose of prayer is to get things from God. Magical prayer. Let me be clear. Is it okay to ask God for things, for help? Sure, yes. He, we're, he wants us to come as children and ask. I'm a father. I want my children to come to me and ask if they have needs or issues. But if all they do is ask, 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 our relationship gets strained in a way. Jesus is saying that God is not a genie living in a bottle that we rub to get our wishes met. Uh, he says, your father knows what you need before you ask him. Another way to say this is that your father knows what you need even better than you do. Prayer is... Discovering what the Father thinks you need most. Magical prayer sees God as a kind of celestial vending machine. It's not that way. Secondly, magical prayer is prayer that assumes that there's a sort of a secret or magical formula that makes prayers successful, makes them work. I was, uh, again, doing some research this week, came across a website quite by accident because it advertised this. On this page, you will find prayers for success in many scenarios that may impact your life. And then it listed out a whole bunch of actual prayers with titles like prayer for a successful life, prayer for success in selling a home, prayer for success at work, and on and on it went. 
And the more I read, the more it was disturbing it was. Like magical, just pray this magical prayer and you kind of get what you want. Jesus is teaching that when prayer is reduced to a formula for success, it becomes a pagan prayer. He says, don't babble like that. Don't pray like they pray. Thirdly, magical prayer is prayer that is, is dishonest in some way, like the young man I met years ago, praying not to be grounded before he was honest about his part in that, or a man praying for his marriage when he's already started an illicit texting relationship with someone at work, or someone who prays for the poor in the world without being willing to serve and care and love the poor. Any prayer that asks God to do that which you are not willing to do is a dishonest prayer. That's magical prayer. Jesus is teaching us that prayer is not a performance, and it's not magic. And the third thing is that it's not a transaction. Prayer is not a transaction. Uh, let me explain. One of the saddest conversations I had, at least at the moment I had this, this part of it, was when a man came into my office at our South Street campus. Oh, this is now 15, 18 years ago. He was holding a Bible. He walked into my office, and he dropped his Bible on my desk, and he, said, he went, I'm done. I said, what's going on? He went on to tell me a, a very difficult, painful story about how one of his children, um, a young man in his 20s, was going through a harrowing journey of mental illness and struggling with some stuff, really scary stuff. And that despite his efforts as father to help, to pray, um, to pray and to pray, that it just kept getting worse. And what he was saying was, I believed, I believed I trusted, I prayed, I served, I gave, and this is what I get. I'm done. Now, fortunately, that story has another chapter to it. But at that moment, he was working on what could be called a business model of faith, a transactional model of prayer. You know, all business is based on a transaction. I give you something, money, for example, you give me goods and services in return. It's a transaction. I give, I get. I give, I get. And sometimes we move into our faith in the same way. We turn prayer into the same kind of model, but that's not what prayer is. Let me read this same passage again. This time, notice the phrase that I put in red three times, okay? Jesus says, and when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by others. Truly, I tell you, they've received the reward in full. But when you pray, go into your room, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like pagans, for they think they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. Three times. Jesus refers to God as Father, but not just Father, as your Father. Now, most of us are so accustomed to using the word Father in reference to God that we don't even hear or notice the power and surprise in what Jesus is saying here. Here it is. Only the gospel allows us to pray like this. A little refresher course. The gospel gives us Promises, new heart through the forgiveness of sin, new identity by being adopted as his sons and daughters, new purpose by living and serving in his kingdom, and new destiny by reigning forever with him in the new heaven and new earth. New heart, new identity, new purpose, new destiny. The richness of the gospel. Talk about identity for a second. Here's how the Apostle Paul explains it in his letter to the Romans. He writes, The spirit you received does not make you slaves so that you live in fear again. Rather, the Spirit, talking about the Holy Spirit, that enters our lives at the moment we receive Christ as Savior and Lord, the Spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship, and by Him we cry, Abba, Father. The Spirit Himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, Jesus called God Father and Abba. Abba was just an Aramaic word that meant my father, kind of a personal term. And the gospel tells us that by Jesus' death and resurrection, we actually are placed into the same relationship with the father that he has with the father. You get that? We've been adopted 
as sons and daughters with the same access, the same relationship that Jesus had with his Father. So only Jesus allows us to pray like this. Only Jesus gives us access to God as Father. A pastor named Tim Keller, many of you have heard of him, pastor in New York City, uh, writes that there are only two ways for human beings to approach God. One is what he calls a business relationship, where we are sort of borders. We pay the rent, he provides us with goods and services. We're borders in a business relationship, or we're children in a family relationship. And children in a family relationship, the father pays the rent and the father provides the goods and services. The father provides all. It's a different kind of relationship. When I was about 25 years old, right in the middle of the emerging adult phase of my life, um, I was at a place, not yet married, um, struggling, to, struggling to find my way. I knew God had called me to something. I just couldn't figure out how to get there. And so I was looking for direction. I didn't really have a job. I was financially struggling. All, all these kinds of ways that are often people in that phase of life struggle with. And one night I decided to pray until I got some answers. I really wanted to know, you know, which school I go to, where do I find a job, direction. So I was praying in all the ways I, I thought I should pray and, and, and knew how to pray by myself in my apartment at night, just praying. The words are just tumbling out of my mind. I was anxious, praying, praying, praying. And, and all of a sudden, and I hesitate to share personal stories about prayer because my story may not be your story. This is just personal, so take it like that. I sensed God sort of say to me, just stop. Stop talking. And in that moment of silence, he said, my name, which was a little surprising, said, Brian, I love you. And I immediately started talking again. I know, I know, I know. I know, but what I really need to know is where do you want me to go? What do you want me to do? How am I going to get there? And he said it again. Just stop, stop. And then he said it again. Brian, I love you. And I said, I know that. I've known for God so loved the world that he, I know that ever since I was a little boy, I've known that. And then he said it again a third time, more forcefully, stop. And he said my name again, Brian, I love you. And the third time, just tears just sprouted to my eyes. And I don't cry very often or very easily, but I did that night. Looking back, I think what was happening there is that God wanted me to know that my identity was not anchored in what I could do for him. It wasn't anchored in my performance, where I would go for him, where I would study for him, what I would say for him. My identity, he wanted to anchor in his love for me. Nothing else. And before I understood that, I wasn't ready to do anything else. That night, I learned a formative lesson in prayer, that prayer is not some sort of religious performance. Prayer is not getting something from God. Prayer, at its root, is being loved by your Father. That's what Jesus tried to teach. Will you bow with me as I close? Lord, thank you for this mystery, this mysterious gift that we call prayer. Remind us today, through your word and by your own example, that prayer is not a religious duty. It's a relationship. Remind us that prayer is not some kind of performance that we do to be seen but it's honesty. Remind us that we don't come to you as slaves, but as your sons and daughters. And so teach us to pray as you prayed. It's in your name that we pray. Amen.